Clinker Factor, the cement industry podcast. Welcome to the Clinker Factor, a podcast from WCA, which looks at the cement industry's response to climate change around the world and other topics of interest. I'm Ian Riley, CEO of WCA, and your host on the Clinker Factor. And today I'm talking to Fuad Kamoun, who is the Director of Sales for the Near East, Middle East, and Central Asia for ThyssenKrupp. And uh, this, this region actually includes everything from Turkey to India, so a very large swathe of the cement world. So Fuad, welcome, and uh, perhaps we could uh, kick it off by asking you to introduce yourself and how you came to be working in the cement industry. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Ayn, for hosting me here. So uh, my name is Fuad Kamun. I originally come from uh, Lebanon uh, and now living in Germany. So uh, after studying electrical engineering in uh, Lebanon, I moved to Germany, did my master's here in uh, business and engineering management, and then uh, joined Tassenko Polisius. And uh, I've been with Polisius ever since. So since 18 years uh, working here, went through different uh, departments. So first in, in service, uh, then uh, sales for service, and uh, in the meantime, in business development and sales uh, for uh, new build projects. So in that time that you've been involved in the uh, in the cement industry, of course, the industry has changed quite a lot. And uh, today, in a lot of the world, uh, decarbonization is uh, such a big topic, although, of course, efficiency and, and uh, costs are, are, are still a big topic too. So I, I'm sure in, in, in that period of time, and particularly the last few years, you must have seen a lot of, of changes in ThyssenKrupp as, as the company responds to the changes in, in the cement industry. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about how ThyssenKrupp has changed. Yes, I, actually, the, the good thing about Tyson for Polisius is that we have been accompanying the cement industry uh, with uh, our research and development for quite a while now. And as you know, decarbonization has, has been... Uh, started and still at the front in, in Europe. And uh, we have had the luck to develop many products uh, and, and find solutions for the, the issues the, the European cement producers have been having towards uh, decarbonization. And through all these cooperations, we have been able to develop different uh, products, so what we call green solutions. And what we definitely see is that our focus and our business is changing towards mostly these products. We, we actually, at the moment, differentiate between conventional cement production and, let's say, green projects or green cement production, which means, let's say, project having decarbonization. Yeah, so I think with um, the cement industry, of course, there's been a lot of concern about the impact of carbon regulation and carbon pricing on the cement industry. And I, I remember with uh, when, when I worked for Holcim, we, we were concerned sort of 10, 15 years ago on the impact that would have on profitability. But actually, what we've seen is that the areas of the world that are, well, let's say, most advanced in terms of regulating carbon, I mean, particularly in, in Europe, have the best profitability at the moment, which um, uh, perhaps says that this is, is more of an opportunity for the industry than it is a threat. And certainly for equipment producers, um, I think it must be quite an exciting time because there's, in addition to a lot of new technologies, there's also the expectation that cement companies are going to have to invest quite heavily to uh, make the transition transition to decarbonized production. So um, is that something you're seeing? It must be an exciting time uh, to be in the field. De definitely, definitely. So it's, it's very exciting because, as you know, all kinds of new technologies are being tested. The different big players, Holcim, Heidelberg, they're testing different new technologies everywhere. So uh, it's, it's exciting on one hand to see, did we really bet on the right you know, direction, the right technologies? We have been developing different technologies uh, lately, and uh, it's it's exciting to see whether these technologies will be the one which will be mostly adopted or not, yeah, or actually which ones will be the ones which will be used mostly after this decarbonization wave going on. Right. So I, uh, let's get to the technologies in a minute. But before we do, let me ask you a little bit about what you're seeing in, in uh, your part of the world. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, you, you cover a, a vast swathe of, of Asia. What are you seeing there? I think it, there's uh, there's a lot of change that uh, you're seeing in, in your markets. Yes, uh, it's also exciting times for, for these markets, for sure. On one hand, uh, you see a really large push for decarbonization. Yeah, So many projects, even from the authorities, were 
know, carbon cement is being required uh, on, on the one hand. Also, you know, all these countries are seeing the efforts on uh, CO2 uh, emission reductions in Europe and other countries. So they also would like to emulate that uh, as well on one hand. So they're pushing for that. On the other hand, uh, it's quite difficult for the cement producers because still they're not being able to make sure that the authorities force a certain, you know, premium for a green uh, cement product, uh, but they have to invest and maybe heavily, let's say. Uh, but it's really interesting to see that everyone is concerned and is trying to understand uh, the different technologies which are there and what they would go for. But in, in many, many discussions, you, you feel that the, the cement producers are really under pressure because looking at the future, they need to decarbonize. They they want to decarbonize, but uh, uh, it's not so easy uh, because they also need, you know, the economical background for that. They need incentives or, or the authorities being, you know, helpful on imposing certain the norms. And uh, uh, in the region, this is uh, this is everywhere the same. It's, it's not so easy for the cement producers. Yeah, yeah no, I think we've seen very clearly, on the one hand, the example that we see around the world since uh, probably 20, well, 1999 or, or, or the year 2000, uh, after uh, the CSI was founded, then you start to see a lot of efforts by cement companies to reduce the uh, CO2 per tonne of cement uh, using those traditional levers of energy efficiency, fuel switching, and clinker factor. And But the things that got done save money as well as saving carbon, right? And when you, when you want to go beyond that to the things that save carbon but cost money, you can only do that if the incentives are in place. Otherwise, you drive yourself out of business because the you know, carbon is such a big part of uh, cement production. Uh, so, so I think you know, we've seen in Europe that um, it took quite a long time before the ETS really had an impact on the behavior of uh, uh, or the choices that companies were making in Europe. And now they, it, there's a, I don't know if we call it a rush, but there's certainly a lot of activity in, in, in CCS. And But it's because it makes very clear financial sense today, not just based on today's carbon prices, but the expectation for the future. I, I wonder where, where in your patch you're seeing the most, what should we say, the most pro progress in terms of regulation that will drive that change. Yeah, so first I, I'd like to add to what you're saying that definitely at the moment in, in my region, producers are looking at the low-hanging fruits, looking at trying to reduce costs and at the same time reduce their CO2 footprint. And I think this is logical. It was the same in, in, in Europe. And as you said, it took a very long time until not only about cost, but also about the reduction of uh, CO2 emissions. And, and I'm happy we're there now. And I think the path will be the same in, in, in the Middle East and around it, that people will start first seeing what can they do you know, rather quickly and, and to reduce their cost and still be economical or reaching a good cement price. At the same time, they are pushing for the authorities to make way for not only SEM1, but other types of cements and, and open up the cement. I, I haven't seen in the region a certain, let's say, country which has made a big jump uh, in, in terms of, of norms. But uh, Turkey, definitely, there uh, a lot is happening. They are trying different types of uh, cements of SCMs. I also see in, in Saudi Arabia, through these uh, Giga projects, who are requesting as much as possible low carbon cement that uh, there it is preferred. Yeah, so uh, th there is some, some movement there. Yeah, I think in, in the case of Turkey, North Africa, maybe a little bit in Saudi as well, the, the CBAM will have some influence. And obviously, there's quite a long phase in, in terms of the of the taxes. Uh, but if, if you're in Turkey, then the Turkish government probably prefers to collect its own carbon taxes rather than let the EU collect the carbon taxes. So I think it's quite uh, interesting to watch that over the next few years as to whether the, the impact of CBAM is that it gradually Gradually spreads the use of carbon pricing. I think let, let's turn now to the uh, to the technologies a little bit. And uh, uh, ThyssenKrupp has been uh, one of the leaders in the in the oxyfuel field. But perhaps um, perhaps you could give us, from your perspective, a kind of sketch of what you see happening uh, at the moment in in CCS and the, and the different technologies that are under consideration. From my perspective, it seems that uh, although MEA is the technology that we've uh, seen go far farthest, I think there seems to be a lot of question as to whether that's really what will be, if you like, the winner or the predominant technology longer term. And, and we hear about a lot of different flavors of oxyfuel. So uh, from ThyssenKrupp's uh, perspective, well, perhaps you could give us a sketch of what you see going on. 
Yeah, well, as, as you know, uh, you know, towards Europe, there are multiple technologies being being tested in terms of uh, CCS. So uh, what we are concentrating on is, so we, uh, let me put it this way, you have, of course, the possibility to have a tail end solution. So to have a, a CO2 capture using a conventional production line and this is being installed and tested multiple projects in Brevik in, in Germany, uh, as well in Beckham. And so there, I think we, we, we will see how, how, how these technologies will help the producers. They are, I think they will definitely work. The question is how economical they will be moving forward. And of course, this is a solution if you have a, a line, a conventional line existing, and you don't want to build a new new line. Uh, our pure oxyfuel solution, the policy of pure oxyfuel solution, is a solution for complete lines, yeah, so a greenfield plant. Basically, the idea is to concentrate the, the CO2. Uh, so instead of having like in a conventional stack 30% of CO2, uh, you have around 90%. And so its extraction using the CCU unit is much more efficient. So um, you don't need that large system in order to extract that much CO2. So in, in general, we have designed the, the cement process in order to make sure that the system behind it to extract the, the CO2 is the most efficient possible. Uh, this is, of course, a good solution if the customer is building a new line for, for whatever reason. In the case of a, a new line, would you be able to, for example, reduce the dimensions of, uh, of the kiln and the ducts and so forth uh, because you're not carrying the air around? Is that is that one of the advantages of this technology? Definitely, definitely. So, so in comparison to a conventional system, you need it to be airtight because you're injecting uh, oxygen uh, and so the whole system has to be airtight and that's why the size of let's say the preheater of all the equipment uh, is is uh, smaller so approximately 40 percent smaller so this means that actually the construction footprint of, of the line will be smaller for the same capacity or production amount for a conversion line the, the lines will be also more compact because they have to be airtight of course, you need uh, the infrastructure behind that. And this is what we are seeing in, in many of the projects coming up. So as you know, uh, we have a pilot plant uh, in Germany, a project called CI4C. This will, this will come into operation uh, end of this year, towards end of this year. But we also have already multiple other projects which have been, uh, which are funded by the uh, European uh, Fund uh, and where we already have also engineering contracts. With the customer. So uh, one of them is uh, in the north of Germany. Uh, the project is uh, called Eskust 100, where actually m maybe this is the future of cement plants. Uh, it's a cement plant integrated in a, in a let's say, a petrochemical complex. So there's an electrolyzer furnishing the oxygen for the pure oxyfuel uh, system, and uh, the CO2 is used to produce uh, methanol. And in the end, we there will be um, an e-fuel which will be produced for the Hamburg airport. Yes, I think it's very interesting because that's an example really of a transformation of the industry rather than just decarbonization. It's really the integration of, of cement with petrochemicals there, where obviously the petrochemicals are looking for post-fossil carbon. And uh, now we might argue as to whether limestone is really fossil free, but uh, that, that, that perhaps is a debate for another time. But it, it's, a, it's a, a very interesting integration of, uh, of the two industries, which you could see, at least in some cases, might be a very attractive solution. And of course, this, this does you know, raise the question, I think, of what the industry footprint is going to look like in you know, 30 years time or, or you know, as the transition goes through. Other than these, um, the pure oxyfuel, um, what, what are the other flavors of oxyfuel that, that, that you're looking at or that your customers are looking at? Like you, like you rightly said, uh, this, this could be where the, where the landscape of cement plants is developing. On the other hand, definitely not everywhere there will be you know, the possibility to invest in such new build projects or maybe the cement plant is already next to CCU facility or next to a petrochemical facility. And also this depends on the amount of CO2 which will be used after that. So, so definitely this will not be the only development which will be uh, happening there. So uh, what we think will also happen is that in, in, for some cases or some countries uh, that we will be modifying uh, existing lines to the oxyfuel uh, process. So they will not be able to extract 90% of CO2, but less maybe around 10, 15% less using, for example, uh, 
separate oxyfuel calcineur. Actually, this will become soon reality. We just signed an, uh, an MOU with Taiwan Cement uh, regarding this technology. Uh, so uh, the, the first pilot plant is, is coming up, and we think all this will be used in multiple locations for sure. And, and this is, is just uh, capturing CO2 from the calciner, or, or did I misunderstand that? So it's uh, actually injecting oxygen uh, in a separate calciner and then extracting CO2. But the kiln remains as is. So, so there, there, there will be some modifications on the kiln, but mm. uh, in general, yes, this is the, the general picture. Yeah. And, and, and does that system capture uh, CO2 from the kiln and from the new calciner? Yes. Okay. So you're still able to capture the majority of CO2 that's emitted from the plant? Yeah, exactly. So. And do you think that the concentration of CO2 with such a system will be slightly lo- lower than with the pure oxy fuel? Is, is that right? Yes, correct. It will it will be lower, and th- I think this is this will be the question in the in the future mm-hmm. for certain plants. How much do I need? I really need to capture, and this will depend on for what the CO two will be used. Yes. So if if you're putting it into storage at the moment, I think you need uh, quite a high percentage, right? Is it? Uh, it and and this is to do with the liquefaction and the the energy to transport. If I if I've got that right. First, first you, you need to see, okay, how much do I need to extract? And then how, how pure it should be, because it needs to be purified. And uh, uh, energy or, or power is another story. Of course, you need, you need a lot of power uh, to, to be able to extract the CO2 on one hand, but also to purify it. And then there's the transport as well. Yes. But like I said, this will depend on the, on the infrastructure uh, after that. But uh, what, what I'm saying now, it's... It's also a bit theoretical. We haven't seen it yet, uh, but for example, in this project in uh, uh, north of Germany, so many companies are working on that and it looks like the solutions are there and, and will work as, as expected. Let's um, go on to uh, talking about another field which is, is getting a lot of attention at the moment, and that's uh, uh, the use of uh, the additional use of SCMs. Obviously, SCMs have been used uh, for a very long time, but I think we're seeing uh, a pressure now, uh, not only uh, in terms of reducing CO2 of cement, but also pressure on our end users, the, the developers, who are, are beginning to get measured and, and, and set targets on the carbon footprint of their of their buildings uh, so they're also looking at uh, you know what they can do and i think typically buildings you're, you're looking at 35 percent of of co2 footprint coming from concrete and maybe another 30 from steel so uh, this is really the two things that that need the um, uh, need to be addressed you you've been uh, policius you've been uh, working on on calcine clay and uh, I think you, you uh, have a flash calciner uh, solution. Perhaps we could start on, on calcine clay, and then we can also touch on more recent development with your, with your mecha clay. So with the, um, uh, with the LC3 and the calcine clay, is this something that you, you now see uh, projects uh, spreading around the world, or is it still concentrated in, in specific geographies? Actually, uh, the last year, we have really a run on uh, inquiries for activated clay and LC3, our laboratory in, in Beckham. So in our research and development center, where we can test different types of, of clay and check if uh, you know they can be used for for uh, production later of activated clay or LC3, uh, uh, our laboratory is completely full. We have barely capacities uh, because we have really such a run on on uh, on activated clays, and this is continuing. So I've been to a conference in, in Dubai, the Semtech uh, lately, and I think 80% of the discussions were about activated clay so the, the interest is quite high uh, i think it's it's a very good thing because i mean scms are coming definitely and will be increasing and uh, with activated clay calcium clay you can produce it in, in large amounts uh, so uh, you can really compensate or, or reduce the clinker factor uh, quite nicely uh, of course you, you need the good clay yeah you need access to to good clay but if it's there then definitely people are moving in that direction. Uh, but just to, to um, talk a moment about good clay, I think that, you know the main requirement is on the percentage of kaolinite, and perhaps also there's a, a concern about color, which of course technically maybe is is not so uh, relevant, but it makes a big difference to customers because customers also o- always think if it changes color, it must be worse, right? So different customers in different parts of the world have different ideas about what good is, but if you give them something else, then definitely 
not happy with it. But, but, but believe me, believe me, the issue of color, it's uh, worldwide. Everyone yes. w- wants black clinker. Well, no, no, not everyone. I, I can assure you there are places that want pink clinker, but the point is they, they, they have an expectation of a particular color, and if it changes, they're not happy. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, usually, usually, as you say, it's dark, but not always, yeah. <laughs> So, but this is something that you you have um, uh, a way of addressing, right? I think in in terms of the way that the the process operates and, and the oxidization of the clay. Yes, so so for, for sure the the kaolin content is is uh, very important. So what we usually do is we test the kaolinite content, and after checking that, we also have to check if you know the the material is is not too hard because uh, clay with high kaolinite could be very hard and then you cannot uh, use it and then definitely exactly what you said we have to test uh, regarding yeah color control but, uh, things are developing there quite well and uh, we have our reference in cameroon so 700 tpd plant mm-hmm. which is uh, running now running smoothly color is good and uh, we have our next uh, plant which will be uh, commissioned in, in ghana but all the tests were, were quite positive so we're, we're optimistic there there is a solution let's say but you need, we need to check it and are there parts of the world that you think will not have the right type of clay or is this something that you see as being very widely distributed actually we uh, have seen that there is clay which is not really usable and uh, you know there are some some geological maps you can mm-hmm. see some materials and in some parts of the world you most probably this clay is not present so there will be parts of the world which will not have good clay to, to cast sign. So, I, I mean, I think uh, actually this brings us to um, an issue of the localization of, of SCM. So, it, you know, historically, we've tended to use fly ash and, and slag, uh, blast furnace slag as being the main SCMs. And obviously, they're uh, related to industrial processes, you know, the uh, byproducts of industrial processes. There's been a lot of work uh, that uh, companies have done on a whole variety of different sources of materials. So uh, uh, steel slags, and industrial revolution era slags, uh, tailings from uh, various different types of uh, metal mines and so forth. And I think one of the things that suggests is that we might we might be more localized in the sourcing of, of SCMs. And that, you know, it, it, obviously, if you're in a volcanic area, you can look at natural pozzolans. If you're in an area that has good clays, then, then, then that's a source. And, and one of the things that I think will also make a difference here is historically in the cement industry, we've really only looked at scope one emissions. And uh, you mentioned earlier about the the connection or the pressure that we're now seeing from government projects to use lower carbon concretes. And of course, once you talk to construction companies, then they're not talking about scope one, they're talking about scope three. And when you include scope three, you're including transportation. And when you, you know, if you move uh, fly ash from India to Europe, then you're going to have a, a big carbon footprint associated with the transportation. So I think this is going to uh, tend to push us towards using local materials uh, well, in almost every market uh, around the world. Is, is this something that you, you've also seen in terms of um, the thinking of, of cement companies? Actually, uh, I think what's happening is that uh, also the construction companies have a big role to play now. Like you said, the, the, the construction companies have also now pressure to, to put the, the low carbon cement into use or even to come up with the, uh, low carbon concrete. Yeah? So uh, definitely construction companies are now an additional player here who, who are really looking at SCMs much more than earlier on. So, uh, and uh, this is what we also see that developments of SCMs to be mixed with cement, so from concrete, is, is increasing. So uh, uh, we see a, a big development there. And we see that construction companies are also, you know, trying to, to convince cement producers to, to produce a low carbon cement, especially because of this, the scope three uh, issue you were talking about. So they they also need to move. And uh, uh, I think this is uh, quite good for the, for the industry because you know, the customers of our customers are also pushing uh, in that direction. So uh, SCMs have definitely a big part to play uh, in the future. Maybe one one point to, to what you just said before, that definitely what's happening is that in each country, there's a local lookout for new SCMs, SCMs which can be used. Um, in my region, we see still more the conventional way, so looking at slag, but I'm sure this will come uh, 
in a few years as well. So, so one of the uh, you know one of the good things with uh, the LC three concept is it's using clay as a widely available uh, raw material, which is a prerequisite for any sort of at scale solution. Um, but of course, it still requires uh, quite a lot of fuel consumption to calcine the clay. Uh, so you also have a, a, an interesting uh, new product called Mecha Clay. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so I, I'll, I'll try to tell you what, what uh, I can disclose. <laughs> so uh, like you said, it's, uh, it's called Mecha Clay. So ME for mechanical and CA for chemical. So it's actually mechanical uh, chemical activation of the clay so not using calcination so uh, practically the the clay is, is inputted in, into a special uh, mill where this mechanochemical activation happens and uh, maybe to to put it in a, in a simple way you know when you activate clay you use uh, heat or you, you calcine it uh, in this process it's uh, uh, it's actually using power of the mill so higher power in order to make this this process happen. And yeah, we're, we're, we're really very, very excited. This is a cooperation with Schwenk Cement. And yeah, the, the pilot plant was just signed. So we're really excited about that because imagine activating clay without a flash calciner or, or calcination. Yeah, this could be quite interesting for the, for the industry. Yeah, absolutely. So making use of a, a widely available raw material without the need to... Uh... Uh, to have calcination, you know, clearly has some um, very attractive uh, characteristics. Uh, so we we'll look forward to uh, hearing more about that word when you <laughs> are able to uh, disclose more. <laughs> What's the timeline on that um, on the project? When when do you expect to uh, have something that is commercially available? This is the, the pilot project. We have been doing a lot of tests. Yeah, in the, in the past year, so we have tested a lot, so we're very confident it will work well, and it should it should uh, run in about one and a half years. It should be commissioned, uh, and then we'll enter commercial. So we have we, we need to be uh, a bit patient until then, but yeah, it's quite quite interesting. Okay, well, good. No, very interesting to talk about this, and uh, this this topic of SCMs is uh, one that we'll be talking about at the WCA conference in. Nanjing on May the 18th. Uh, so I hope that uh, many of our listeners will be able to come and uh, uh, and hear more about it. Uh, so uh, Fouad, uh, it's been uh, wonderful speaking to you today. Very interesting uh, tour of, of what's going on in terms of, of technology and uh, the response of both the cement industry and the, the uh, equipment industry uh, in response to the challenges uh, that we face from uh, climate change. And uh, many thanks for, for joining me today. Thank you. Uh, I'm very much for, for hosting me. And uh, I'd also like to encourage uh, the listeners to go to the WCA conference. I uh, really enjoyed it the past two years. It's a very nice uh, format. I really like, you know, the touch of panel discussions you have put in there. Also, the setup quite compact and, and uh, makes things uh, quite interactive. So also, from my side, I hope many of the listeners will be, will be joining as well. Well, many thanks. Thanks for listening to the Clinker Factor podcast today. If you've enjoyed it, do subscribe and please recommend us to friends and colleagues and anyone else who you think would be interested in what's happening in the cement and concrete industry around the world. WCA is a not-for-profit company. Please visit our website to see the services that we offer 